just do a very brief refresher on what is indexing. So first of all, what is a sparse index? Shown by this example, I have data which is stored sorted on the ID here. So now this is an index which helps me quickly find an ID that I want to find. The index does not have an entry per ID, otherwise it will be very big. It has one entry per some number of IDs here. So first I will search, if I want to look up ID 45565, I will go here. Is it greater than 101? Well, uh, this index starts with the lowest value, but I could even not store this value and it will be fine. Is it greater than 32343? If not, look at the previous pointer. Uh, otherwise, check if it is greater than 76766. The value I am looking for is 45565. So it is greater than this, but less than this. Therefore, I will follow this pointer and then search sequentially here, which I will reach it pretty fast. This is the basic idea of an index. This is a single level index. Of course, database data is very big. Uh, single level index is not sufficient. So what is actually used is a multi-level index. So the way it's organized is data is stored in blocks here, sorted on whatever key the index is built on. And what is stored here, I'll come to in a little bit. It could be the actual record, it could be a pointer to the record. But regardless of what is stored here, if I build an index on a particular attribute or set of attributes, you sort the uh, data on that key and put it in blocks. And then the pointer here, you know, I'll start with the outer index, find the appropriate pointer, go in there. Within that, I apply the same algorithm to find the data block. And then in the data block, I'll find the key that I want. This is conceptually what tree indices do in general. There are many, many types of tree indices, but all of them use basically the same concept. So each level of the tree index is a sparse index on the lower level. So this level is a sparse index on this. This level is a sparse index on this. Why sparse? If you see for maybe 100, 200 entries here, I have just one pointer here. Now each of these blocks itself will have several hundred entries but there's just one pointer here for several hundred entries. So it becomes smaller. Each level becomes like a hundred times smaller than the previous level. So with a few levels, uh, I can quickly find what I want. Now each level here is potentially a new disk seek because each of these may be at some different location on disk. Each is a block, maybe somewhere on disk. So if I want to fetch a block, I have to do a disk seek. On hard disk, how long will this take? Well, if it's already in the in-memory buffer, it may be fast, but if it's not, it might take something like five to 10 milliseconds. Okay. So if I have a disk which takes, say, five milliseconds for a request, how many requests can it satisfy in one second? 200 requests. Now, if I'm building a website with, um, so, so first of all, 200 is the limit for one disk. Now, for each level in this index, I may have to do a disk seek. So if I have an index with 10 levels, I'll have to do 50 milliseconds. And then instead of 200 lookups, I can only do 10 look, uh, uh, sorry, 20 lookups. So this tree has to be short. So an index like this is always short. The second thing is, if you keep inserting, deleting data, how do you maintain this index? What if too many records are deleted from this block? It has very few records. What do you do? You need to maintain this index. And the key idea of B-trees, which is proposed in 1972, a long time back now, 40 plus years now, is that um, they adapt bit by bit, each time you do an insertion or deletion, either no change happens or a small change happens, but you never have to go and reorganize the whole index at once. So that's the key idea. I'm sure you're all familiar. How many of you don't know about B-trees? 
all of you have few. Okay. So, since there are very few, I'm not going to actually cover it here. I'm not going to cover basics of B plus trees, but I'll cover some more advanced topics. So, all of you know this is a B plus tree. So, there are some examples in the book of B plus trees. I'm going to skip all that. And I, I just want to um, say a little bit here. Actually, this slide is outdated. I'm going to replace it for the main workshop with newer slides. Um, so, the key point I want to make here is if you have a unique key, that is, a, there's only one record with a particular key, not more than one record with a particular key. It's very easy to understand how to use a B plus tree. So, all the standard B plus tree algorithms make this assumption to keep life simple. If you see any textbook description of a B plus tree, typically it will make this assumption that the key is unique. In fact, keys need not be unique. Why? If it's an index on a primary key, yes, it is unique, no problem. But many times I want to index on something which is not a primary key. If I uh, want, if I'm a uh, bank or, or a university and I hear that so and so student has done something, I want to find out who is this student. I don't know their roll number. I want an index on name. So, I can look up the student by name. Now, there will be many students with one name. Let's say I do it by first name or last name separately. There are many people with the same first name, many with the same last name. So now the key is no longer unique. There are many records with the same key. And I need to store pointers to all of them. Okay? What to do about this? This is an issue which any real system has to address. And by and large, textbooks shove this aside. We also kind of did this. We in, in the in sixth edition, we decided to address this issue and say, how do you handle duplicates? And uh, in the hurry to put it out, we goofed up. And our algorithm for handling duplicates actually has bugs. We have corrected it in the errata. We realized it soon after it was published. So if you read the sixth edition and read the part on B plus trees, Please read it in two ways. One is, assume there are no duplicates, there is no problem. Everything works. We do talk about duplicates, but there is a bug in the way we have described it. So, for the case with duplicates, please look up the errata. Now, it is possible that you have a more recent printing where the errata was fixed. We did give it to the publishers. But it's all, even more likely you have a copy, I, I, I don't know, in the current one, printing whether it has been fixed. But in all the older printings, this bug is there. So, please look up the errata page. Okay. So, that of course leaves the question answered. So, how do you deal with duplicates? So, there are several options. Uh, so, in the, oh, okay. This, this slide actually does have the errata note. Okay. I thought this was an older slide. Uh, this does have it. So, I, I don't have time to get into this now, um, but I'll just mentioned that you should go read this up to see how to deal with duplicates if you want. But in fact, there is another solution which is also very widely used in the industry which is get rid of duplicates. How do you get rid of duplicates? I am going to tell you that my B plus 3 implementation will not handle any key with duplicates. At the same time, you want to be able to do lookups based on names which might have duplicates. Can we do something about this? Yeah. yeah. So the basic idea is B plus trees luckily support range queries. So if I, uh, what I will do is in the B plus tree, I will create a key containing the name followed by the roll number. Okay, name has duplicates, roll number does not. Name followed by roll number does not have duplicates. Now, my B plus 3 code can handle this because it is unique. I do not have to deal with duplicates in my B plus 3 code. But now, what about my original problem? I wanted to find students with a given name. How do I do it? I can do a prefix query. 
or I can do a equal a, equivalently a range query. I can say give me all names. The key is name plus roll number. So name followed by the minimum roll number, let's say 000, up to name followed by the maximum roll number. That's the range I'm looking for. So find me all things in this range. And that will give me all the things. So when I insert, there are no duplicates. When I do a single lookup based on name plus roll number, there are no duplicates. When I get a range query, that's not a problem. The standard B plus tree code handles range queries and gives me back a set of names. Is this clear? I don't want duplicates. So I get rid of duplicates by adding something unique, roll number, or it can be a record ID or anything else. It, and then I do a range lookup. So this is a standard trick which many databases use. Why do they do it? Are they too lazy to go implement uh, non-unique search keys on B plus trees? Turns out there are other good reasons for doing this. And the book talks about some of these reasons. In particular, um, efficiency of uh, deletes is better if you make it unique. And the second thing is concurrency control techniques are a little easier to deal with. Um, and even the code for handling B plus tree splits and so on is easier if you make the unique assumption. But we have discussed this in the new edition of the book. In the old editions, it was not there. Now, there are several implementations, like I said. One is to keep, actually, duplicate keys, keep a list of duplicate, uh, sorry, keep the key once, but with that key, there are many records. You can keep a set of record pointers. Uh, or make it unique. So that's where we left off. Then the next topic is, what should the index contain? Should it contain a pointer to a record, which is stored somewhere in the database? Or should it contain a record itself, the contents of the record? If you ask this question about, uh, say, 15 years back or 20 years back, pretty much all databases would store the record in some place. When the record is created in the system, it goes to some page, and it lives there for the rest of its life. Unless, for some reason, this, uh, you know, the record increases in size, there's no space in the page, it has to be moved. Moving of records was a rare occurrence. They land up at one place and live the rest of their life there. Okay, this is like being in a government job. Get a government job, you be there till you retire. Uh, but today's world is a little bit different. People keep moving across jobs, and it's no longer viewed as important that a record sits in one place for its whole life. So why does this matter? So if you go to an old database and say that I want the data sorted in some order. I want to fetch all records in a certain key range. I can build a secondary index on uh, some keys, but the records will be scattered all over. If I want all the records which in, a, in a range, they will be scattered all over. Now it's very inefficient to jump around on disk and fetch data. So we, uh, there are a lot of examples where you can see a huge performance difference because of this. So we had an um, uh, index which would index a record on keywords. And the records were, not, uh, the index records themselves were not organized properly on keywords. Well, the, I won't get into the details, but we had a table which had a keyword to record mapping. And that table was indexed on keyword, but the table was not sorted on keyword initially. So now to fetch all the uh, record IDs which are scattered all over would take a very long time. So then we told the system, in this case PostgreSQL, sort the file, sort the relation. And once it did that, suddenly, if you wanted to find all the records with the keyword, they were all together. What took uh, you know, 20 seconds would now finish in half a second. It's that kind of huge difference. So you do want, in many cases, data to be sorted so that you can fetch many records which are co-located. So old database systems would allow you to take a relation and say, sort this relation now and build an index after sorting it. But you could only sort a relation in one way. If I want two different sortings, tough luck. So in PostgreSQL, uh, as of at least 9.1, they may change it in future. As of 9.1, this still held. 
I could say sort the relation, cluster the relation, and I sort it on something. If I build an index on that attribute on which it is sorted, it's very efficient to find all records with a certain range of key values. But supposing I want the same relation, I want to index it in this way on two different attributes. What to do? Okay. So the solution to this, there are actually two possible solutions. One solution was to say, look, I will um, take the record, uh, sorry, the index. The in index is on, let's say, word. But I will c uh, create an index not just on word, but on word, comma, the extra data which I want. So in this case, I wanted record uh, ID, which was one of the fields of the relation. So I built an index on word, comma, record ID. Now when I go through this index contents, what happens? I will find all the word record ID pairs in the index. And I may escape not even going to the actual relation. That will also have a pointer to the relation, but I need not go there because I already have the data in the index. So this is called index only access. Index only access is very useful because it can uh, get records which are clustered even though the relation may not be sorted on that attribute. Uh, so why, what about PostgreSQL? Does it support this kind of thing? It turns out PostgreSQL has a multi-version concurrency control mechanism which interacts a little badly with this. So there may be two versions of the record. Both those versions are there in the index. One of the versions is old, one is new. Uh, looking at the index, I cannot tell which is the version that I am looking for. I have to go to the record. So there is a slight catch. Uh, so PostgreSQL didn't have this earlier. I, I think in more recent versions, people have been working on some very clever hacks to avoid the lookup for most records, to pay the extra lookup only for some records, not for all. So they're working on that, and there are some nice ideas there. But other database systems which didn't have uh, multiple versions, it was a lot easier for them. And um, so they could provide uh, index indices where you can add extra attributes, they're called. Covering indices. And then index only access. So many databases support it. And PostgreSQL has started supporting parts of it now. That's one answer. The other answer is, what about storing the records themselves in the B plus tree? Why store a pointer to a record? Why not store the whole record in the B plus tree? Okay. So this is called a B plus tree file organization. So the records don't live outside of the B plus tree. They're, they live only in the B plus tree. This is where they live. In the earlier systems, a record would be put in some page when it's inserted, and it lives there. Now it lives in the B plus tree. Now all of you who are uh, familiar with B plus trees know that there is a difference. Uh, B plus trees are dynamic. Pages get split. Records move. So earlier, there was a notion of a record ID. And the typical record ID was like a page number, like uh, in the file, which page in the file, and inside that page, which record. And the record never moves, so the record ID never changes for a record. Now, when uh, pages split in a B plus tree, the record moves. So what is the record ID? Now, why do I want a record ID? If I have another index on that same relation, it needs to store some kind of a pointer to the record. And that pointer used to be the record ID, the physical record ID, the location in some sense of that record. But now, you can't do that because every time a page splits, half the records in that page move, and if I have to go and update all the other indices that point to this record, it becomes very, very expensive. One page split can turn into 50 different page accesses on other indices, each of which has to be updated, so it becomes very slow. 
So this is one reason people initially did not implement B plus tree file organization. But eventually, uh, they, uh, there is a simple solution to this problem, which eventually many people implemented. And the idea is this, that in the secondary indices, so there is one index, which is the primary index. The primary index doesn't have to be on the primary key. It can be on any key. It's clustered on that, and the records are stored in a B plus tree file organization, the record is stored right in the leaves of the B plus tree. And now there are other indices on other attributes. Those indices no longer store a record ID. Instead, they store the primary index search key. And that has to be made unique, of course. Um, so uh, some form of unique ID for the record has to be primary key, also has to be part of that. So if the relation is uh, let's say sorted on some key C, you'll add the primary key of that relation or some other unique key, append it to C, so it's sorted on C, but you can still have a unique um, ID for that record. And so when a split happens here, nothing happens to the secondary indices. Why? Because they stored the key value. When a split happens, the key doesn't change. The, and you normally will use the uh, something which doesn't change typically. That's what you would like to use. Uh, because if that is updated, then you have to change it in all the indices. But that's part of life. If you update a record, you have to go change all indices where the record occurs. So that is OK. But when you split a leaf, you don't want to go and update all other indices. Because now you suddenly touch hundreds of records. You don't want to do hundreds of updates. So this takes care of that. Now, what is the cost of this? This means when you use the secondary index, you traverse down the index, you don't find a pointer to the record, you find a key. You have to take this key, come back to the primary index, and then search down again. So instead of one B plus tree traversal, you have turned it into two B plus tree traversals. So that is the price you pay for it. But it has been uh, very useful for many applications. So uh, one after another, all the commercial databases supported this about 15, 20 years back, they all supported it. I mean, the idea was very old, but they had not implemented it for many years. Any questions? So this is regarding, so, so in 95, 1995 itself, we started using one tool which is called as fragmentation, defragmentation tools. Yeah. Is there any relationship uh, in between these two ideas? Um, in some sense, yes. So disk defragmenters, what do they do? So if you have a file which is fragmented, that means pieces of the file reside here on this piece, the next piece there, the next piece somewhere else. And when you try to read that file, it takes a long time. And this particularly hap starts happening if your disk is full. Any new files you create in a disk which is get over, say, 90% full, tend to be fragmented. Uh, so the way to improve performance is to resort all the f files on disk, reorganize such that all the blocks of a file are sequential on disk. So if you read them, you don't have to move the disk arm around. That is very expensive. So disk defragmentation essentially sorts the blocks of the file and uh, in the order, sorts meaning the physical layout is in the um, order that they appear in the file. Um, so sort clustering a relation, like I told you, is kind of like this, but at a logical level. At the physical level, how the system manages it is up to the system. But what happens is um, systems are usually good at this. Um, so if you sort a file, database systems will make uh, efforts to keep the blocks consecutive. So there are some nice tricks uh, which they use. They cannot be guaranteed to be consecutive on disk, but it will do a best effort to, so that you minimize the amount of disk movements to scan a particular file. So one more question. This is related to that composite key. So we are using composite key in the relational database management system. It means that we are going to treat more than one field values as a primary domain values. A composite key, composite, is a, key. composite key is one which has multiple fields put together. And you use the normal sorting order. First sort on the first key, then on the second, and then on the third. So they are very useful for many things. So it's common to build indices on a composite key. And then you can actually do an index lookup on a prefix of the key, if you wish. So that's what we did, actually. When the thing I told you, first you have a, some key, second, which may have duplicates, and then the 
uh, primary key. That's a composite key, because it had two attributes. And you can do a lookup on a prefix, which will return possibly many records. Yeah, so uh, in the B plus T file organization, the complete record would be copied uh, in the index file or some partial record, it's typically the, the columns which are frequently accessed. Or no. So if you store only some columns, then you have to store the entire record somewhere else. So that is a regular index with extra attributes and that is called a covering index. So when you store the record itself somewhere else. But when you store the record itself in the leaf of the B plus tree, then it's a B plus tree file organization. So DBMS have three level architecture and at the physical level it is defined that we have the frame memory model and unifying model. How they are related with this indexing part to tune the system at physical level? Okay, so first of all, uh, the physical level view, uh, level, uh, logical level, whatever. Okay. Those are all very high level concepts which um, don't have a direct bearing on this. So that, that is something which we have already dealt with. All of this is the physical level. Okay, the relations are the logical level. We are working at this point, we have moved from uh, relational database design to storage and indexing and so on, which are all purely at the physical level. So the other levels are irrelevant to us right now. Now when you're doing database design, you need to worry about the other levels, but not so much now. Although in some cases, if depending on how things are accessed at higher levels, you may choose appropriate physical structures below. What do I mean by this? Supposing you have a lot of queries which retrieve a record based on some key, then you should build an index on that key. So what you do here depends on what queries are being executed on the system. The queries don't know about the log, uh, physical layer. They are working at the logical level. But your physical design is generally optimized for the uh, workload which you find on the system. So that choice of what indices to create, and uh, I mentioned uh, materialized views earlier, what materialized views to create and so on is part of uh, the physical design of the database. And that's an important part of uh, tuning a system. We don't have time to get into it. But so yeah, from which interface we can put this type of indexing B3 or we want to change the structure of the organization of the files in the DBMS? Yeah, so most databases will uh, provide uh, ex SQL extensions. Uh, so the SQL standard try to stay out of this, uh, but most people, mo most databases provide a fairly standard syntax for create index. Now that create index command can take a number of extra arguments which are database specific. So there you can say you want a B plus tree index, you want a file organization, you want it uh, this way, you want it that way. So there are many options which you can specify. So PostgreSQL has many such options. Oracle has its own set of options. So that is database specific. But you can do all of this from the SQL interface. Uh, in a B plus tree, B plus tree file organization, you said that entire records will be stored. What if records yeah. are of variable length? How okay. node size will be defined initially? Okay. That's a good question. What if a record is variable length? How is it stored? Okay. So as long as the fields of the record are relatively small and the whole record is uh, smaller than a page, uh, you can uh, store records with a variable length. Um, if you want to know how the records are physically stored, uh, chapter 10 has a description. Um, let me just briefly show that. So this is an example of a variable length record. So what it does is, uh, there are four fields here. Uh, the first one is the ID, the name, uh, the department, and the salary. Now if you see here, the first three are variable length fields. Name, uh, sorry, ID can be variable length, let's say. Uh, if it's fixed length, it can be stored here, but if variable length, it goes there. So what it's storing is, where is it starting in this array, and how long is it? So the first field is name, so it says 21.5, and there is a data dictionary which says that this is a variable length field. So I'll interpret these first few bytes as an offset plus length. So now I know it's starting at 21 and it's length 5, and I read those 5 bytes to get the ID. The next field is name, so I uh, say so it's 26.10, so I go to 26 and read 10 characters, get Srinivasan. The next one is 36.10, so I go to position 36, comp psi. The next one is 
65,000. It's fixed length, so it is in line here. And then there's one extra thing, which is null bitmap. So if any of these fields is uh, null, you can actually store zero offset, zero length. Uh, but if this is null, you would store a bit in the bitmap here. Okay, so that's how variable length records are represented. So when you fetch this record, you have to uh, interpret this structure and then extract the fields that you want. And in turn, this is one single record. Now, how do you store these records in a page? When you have variable length records in a page. If it's all fixed length, you divide the page into equal size pieces, it's very easy. If it is variable size, typically what is done is this is called a slotted page architecture. So you store all the records at the, let's say, one end of the page. Uh, and then at the other end of the page, you have an array of entries which point to the records. In between is the free space, unused. So what does this header say? It says there are so many records in this page currently. And um, some of these may be empty, actually. If the record is deleted, you may have a hole here. The entry will not point to anything. Uh, but if it does exist, it has a pointer to um, the place where the record starts. And then there's a length also, which can be stored here. The size of the record is stored here, and the location is stored here, logically. I mean, physically in the page. The diagram is logical. Physically, it's all linear in the page. Uh, so that's how you store variable length records in a page. And if a record changes in size, you move records around in the page to make space. So for B plus tree, we say the, we have to define nodes like uh, si of size n. If it is a, this n is 3, then with, it will have three pointers. And here we yeah. are talking about page. I'm not understanding okay. so, those two terminal yeah. relation between those two terminology. Okay. So uh, again, I didn't talk uh, about variable length keys. It's again there in the book and in the slides. For today, I skipped it. But since you asked that question, uh, the initial coverage of B plus trees assumes a fixed n that you will have at least n by 2 entries for some number n, which is perfectly fine for fixed length records, fixed length keys. The B plus tree stores keys. Uh, and f if you are talking of a file organization, for fixed length records. Uh, but if the key itself is variable length, this can happen, right? Name is a key, it's variable length. Or for a file, length, a file organization, the record is there, and the record can be variable length, as we just saw. So now, how many things you can fit in a page depends on how big the key or the record is. We can't guarantee this. But what we can guarantee then is not the number, but the occupancy of the page. So we can say that the B plus 3 page will be half full with data, at least. Maybe more than half full, but it will be at least half full of data. Now, how many entries are there? That depends on how long the keys are. We, we can't say that up front. But if we say that the average uh, key is so long, uh, say average name length is 20 bytes, then we can say the average entry is let's say 30 to 35 bytes, now we can calculate the average number of pointers out of the B plus tree. But we don't actually have a minimum number of pointers, but we can say that the space will be half occupied. That we can guarantee. And now, given a particular level of the B plus tree and the average size of the keys, you can say that on average, each node will have so many children at a minimum. Some may have less if they have longer keys. Sir, excuse me. Uh, sir, here. Yeah. Sir, you have mentioned that, that the, uh, each record, the starting address and the length will be there. So, for yeah. example, if the department, if the changed, that is, if initially yeah. it's a computer science, if it Correct. changed, then the consecutive value should be changed. Absolutely. So, you, you will actually change the size of the record. So, what happens then is you have to move some records here to make space for it. Uh, it but you will keep it compacted, meaning you won't have holes in this area. And the important thing is, you can move records in a page because externally nobody will store a direct pointer to the record. They will store an offset into this header array. So all you do when you move this is you update the pointer in the header. So an external, let's say a, a, an index which is storing a pointer to the record, the record is moving in the page. But the index does not have to be updated because it is storing an offset in the header array, not the actual data pointer. Okay. Even though that's a, it is, if it is in the continuous location, it will affect all the data, no? Uh, so, yeah, if it will affect everything in this page. So, yeah. if, supposing you change the size of this record. Now, everything here may have to be moved. 
but only in that one page. You don't have to touch other pages. Let's see how we can uh, define the order of the page. By order, do you mean the physical order or the number of children? Order. Sometimes physical that order. word is used for number of. The physical order. The physical order. So, if you create a B plus tree on a particular key, uh, the thing is sorted on that key. Now, how is the sort order defined? That is uh, dependent on the implementation and on the type. Integer sorting is standard. What about sorting of strings? That may be language specific. You know, sorting in Hindi is different from sorting in English. So, whatever it is, it's sorted in that order. Sir, so, uh, it will be the different number of uh, nodes uh, for the searching in each label. Uh, if you have variable length keys, the num so no, I, I didn't follow your question. So first of all, yeah. the number of children may vary depend if you have variable length. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, actually, I would like to say there is a the, uh, different number of nodes. Uh, sorry, different number of uh, keys in a particular node. Yeah, it can vary. Even in a normal B plus tree with fixed length keys, depending on what order insertion deletion happened, a node can have anywhere from uh, n by 2 to n for some n, that many children. It can vary. So that will be, that is true for a fixed length records, it's also true for variable length records. Only thing is with variable length records, you can't guarantee a minimum of n by 2, it depends on the record length. Or the key length. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. The indexing hmm. will it work? I am seeing the option index, or by default it will do the indexing for all the relations. So, uh, okay, that's a good question. So, what indices I, I interpret it as? If you create a relation, will it be indexed automatically? Is that yeah. what you mean? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's a good question. So, on pretty much all databases, will automatically create an index on the primary key. If you define a primary key, they will create an index. Why? Because if you insert a record, they have to check that there is no duplicate. Without an index, it will be very expensive. So, they will create an index. Most databases will also create an index on a foreign key. Why? Because if you delete the referenced record, then the referencing record is affected. Unless you have an index, it's very expensive to find out if there is a referencing record. So, uh, if you declare a foreign key, usually an index will be created on the foreign key also. These are the minimum set which most databases will automatically create. Now, beyond this, what indices do you need? It depends on the uh, queries which are asked on the system. So, Many databases have a tool called an index tuning wizard or a database tuning assistant or there are many different names for it. So what that tool can be used for is you, you, you know what kind of uh, queries run on that database. You can actually run a test system and run the kind of queries which you expect to run. It can record those things and then the system will see you are asking a lot of queries which are doing a lookup on some field, which is not the primary key field. I will add an index for that. So that kind of uh, decisions, uh, these uh, tuning assistants, wizards, uh, call it what you want, but there are tools. PostgreSQL, I don't know if it has one at this point, but the commercial databases all have such tools. So, so if you delete all the records for a particular key, then that key record will also be deleted from the index or it would still maintain it? So, at the leaf level, that key will vanish. At internal nodes, the key may still be present. So, we have an example in the book right. uh, which shows this. Okay, uh, because at the internal level, the keys are simply used to guide the search. Right. You can remove it, but it's, it doesn't make any difference because okay. the keys of the internal nodes are simply guiding keys. Right. There, there's no implication that they actually are present in a record. So, if a B plus tree node becomes underfull, you are going to take action. Uh, you, you might merge it. Actually, many implementations don't do merging of underfull nodes. Only if the node becomes empty, do they do something. Uh, but that's an implementation choice. The B plus tree algorithms uh, allow you to do merging if they become underfull. 
And at that point, uh, whenever any such operation happens, some keys may get removed. And I want to, I want to add uh, uh, something. Uh, sir, ask the questions about the, uh, the logical level and physical level where the indexing will fit. As I think it will come in logical level. Because... So, so the uh, actual index construction is at a physical layer. But the decision to build an index, so the interface says build an index on this attribute of this relation. But the index itself is very much part of the physical design. It's not part of the logical design. That's how the layers are defined. The logical design only sees a relation. Yeah. It is not worried about performance. Yeah. Indexing is a performance issue which is at the physical layer. Just a, it is a easy to access or fast. Yeah, Nothing more than this. Exactly. That's Indexing. why it is a physical feature, not a logical feature. It could be a change when you change the function or uh, the, the fetching uh, for it, you want to. You can add and drop indices. Applications will still run. They may run very slowly, but they will, uh, it won't affect the correctness. So it's purely physical. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, so I want to uh, complete a bunch of other stuff. I'll stop uh, questions on indices here. Just want to mention a few, a couple of words, uh, buzzwords. Um, so one of them is called bulk loading of indices. And the idea is, supposing you take a relation and fill it with a lot of records, one at a time, and you have defined some indices on that relation. Initially, everything will run fast when the relation is small. But if the relation becomes very big, you will find that it takes a lot of time to add all the records to that relation. So uh, any book on tuning will say first drop the index on the relation, then add the record, drop all indices on the relation, including the primary key, drop everything. Then add the records, then create the indices back again. Now, why would they recommend that? And the answer is that if you insert records one at a time into the index, it's a lot of I.O. which happens. On the other hand, there is a technique called uh, bottom-up building or uh, bulk loading of a B plus tree index, which is much more efficient. It basically sorts the records and then creates a tree with far fewer I.O. operations than if you inserted one record at a time. So it's much, much faster. I mean, it's like something which takes hours can run in minutes. That, that's the kind of difference which people actually see. This is not just hypothetical, it's real. So. What has happened is um, the underlying B plus tree implementation, when there's already a relation and you say create index on it, it doesn't do the insertion as we saw. Instead, it does sorting and builds it. How does it do it? Again, the details are there in the book. Uh, this is a bottom up build. And so that is uh, why the tuning uh, books all, will always tell you drop indices, insert records, then rebuild indices. Now, the question arises, what if you can't do this? If you are, uh, I, I mentioned big table, right? Uh, Google's big table um, as a, a key value store. It's actually a B plus tree index which is distributed across many, many machines. Now there, if you say drop the index and rebuild it on uh, you know, one billion keys, this is not a joke. Okay, it will take a huge amount of time to build the index. What happens to applications which run during that time. Okay, so there's a bunch of research which happened on this, including some which we did in IIT Bombay back in 1997, on how to um, have efficient insertion into B plus trees. And uh, one such technique is used in big table, I won't get into the details, uh, to make inserts into the big table B plus tree index much more efficient than the normal B plus tree insertion. If you're interested in it, um, there's a paper on Bigtable which describes all these details. You can go read it. So Bigtable is essentially an enormous B plus tree index spanning many, many machines. So it's pretty cool. So if you're interested, do read that paper. That's the very last slide on indices. I have focused on B plus tree indices. It's not the only kind of index, though. Uh, there are several other kinds of indices. There is something called a bitmap index which is primarily used for attributes with very few distinct values. And its goal is a little different. 
uh, usually his goal is not to find a few records. His goal is usually to um, do some other operations such as uh, find uh, to, it, what the bitmap index does is it creates a bitmap which says that uh, a bitmap for a particular value. Let's say I want uh, department is comp site. Let's say the institute has only 10 departments. A bitmap index will create a bitmap, one bitmap, one array for computer science. For every instructor who is in computer science, the bit will be one, for others it will be zero. Now what do I mean by that? The instructors also have to be in some order, one, two, three, four. Okay. Somehow it, that order is fixed, it should not change. And then you can create a bit, which is one if the instructor is in computer science, zero otherwise. This is the computer science bitmap. Then another bitmap for electrical, another for civil, and so forth. Mm, now, what is the use of these bitmaps? I can do various intersection and union operations very, very efficiently with it. Won't get into the details. Uh, so it's used for uh, certain uh, OLAP kind of operations, uh, data analysis operations. It's not very useful for finding a record with a particular roll number. That's not what a bitmap is for. It's used for other operations. Then there are hash indices, uh, which are used a uh, lot in memory during query processing. Uh, they were used at one point for disk indices, but people have given up on it. Uh, they don't give any great benefits over B plus trees, but they have a big drawback of not allowing um, uh, range queries. So they have been more or less abandoned. And then there are R trees which are used to index geographical data, multidimensional data. A B plus tree assumes a sort order. But how do you sort, let's say, locations in a map? You can't sort on X or Y. Which one do you choose? Latitude or longitude? Okay, so it's not clear. So for such two-dimensional data, uh, R trees, and there are many other indices, but R trees are widely used in databases. So PostgreSQL supports R trees, for example. Most Databases today support R trees for such spatial data. So that's it for indices. Uh, last, any last questions on indices before we move on? Oh, uh, I should also mention one other point here, which is uh, when we do uh, query plans, you will uh, on PostgreSQL, you will see something called a bitmap index scan, uh, I think bitmap, uh, I forget the exact name that is there, okay? Now, I just told you about bit, bitmap indices. Now, PostgreSQL does not actually have bitmap indices, but it has, um, it, it has something else which is not really an index, it's a kind of data structure computed on the fly which it calls bitmap index. Okay, I'll come to that later when we uh, work on query plans in Postgres. But I just want to mention that now because PostgreSQL, which we will look at in the lab, uses this term bitmap index scan for a different thing. It's not the regular bitmap index. It's related, but it's a different beast. Okay, so uh, don't get confused when you see it. That is not, in the book, there is a section on bitmap indices. That is completely different from the PostgreSQL's use of bitmap index scan. It's a different term. 